So last week, um, we I think we ended. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we ended on a pretty good note. And uh, in terms of like what we think we have for a spec, will actually work. And I think this week the goal was to see if, you know, um, to try some attestations out and see if what we've actually designed will actually work. <laughs> Is that does that sound like we're in the same place? Yep. Yep. Let's do it. All right. So, who wants to? Uh, uh, do we want to start with something like SSDF? Do we want to start with ISO twenty seven thousand something or other? <laughs> I I would just as soon start with SSDF because it's uh, so timely. You know, they're actually <laughs> demanding attestations, so. Uh, might as well do that. I mean, we could do, you know, ASVS or NIST mm -hmm. 800 or 161 or whatever, but uh, 853 or 161 or whatever. But I think SSDF is as good as any of them. Okay. PCI right. would be a good one to try. Okay. All right. Well, let's so, uh, let's uh, unless there's any objections, we can uh, we can start with SSDF. Does that does that sound good to everyone? Okay. All right. Um, where is my share screen? Um, I'm just going to share my IntelliJ for the time being. Let's see. I'm going to try to pull up the SSDF. Um, and uh, let's see. Where is it at? Where's the full thing? Oh yeah, so NIST uh, 800-218. Okay, so NIST 800-218, that's what we're kind of targeting for our attestations, uh, at least to prove it out. So I'll put that link in the chat window. Um, I have not put this into uh, uh, into a proper schema so um I, I can't really necessarily validate it but uh we'll we'll go through here and, and just kind of just kind of see i'm going to make a copy of this and then uh i'll create a new new version new file i guess um <clears throat> Oh, I just, yeah, I just did a thing on this. What's up? I was just remembering, I just put a, a spreadsheet together on how contrast supports the SSDF. So uh, just, I've been, I, I just remembered, I've just been through all these requirements. Ah, so they're probably really fresh in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Just got to find it. Okay. Um, so the first section in SSDF is prepare the organization, right? Right. Uh, so they've got a, a practice called prepare the organization. They've got it. Let me let me actually let me share this browser window that I'm that I'm looking at, so people on the watching the video can can see as well. Um, So yeah, we've got the section on prepare the organization and then underneath there we've got task. Um, so this is basically, I guess, um, um, the, from a Cyclone DX at the station perspective, uh, this would be kind of the requirement and sub requirement, I think. 
Yeah, the standard is the overall, and we've got the, the question is, would you want to go into a requirement, sub-requirement right away and actually classify the POs as, you know, the, the higher level there, or would you want to jump right into tasks? I think you could easily go either sure. way. Yeah, I mean, I, my, my thinking is that the structure helps, and there's an implied requirement that's like, prepare the organization for you know what like it it's it's the it's a synthetic requirement that uh, is just the collection of the things under it yeah well in this case i think ssdf does it for us uh because this uh this practice actually has an identifier it's p po that one and oh, right. everything everything on the on the niece is po one that one and one that two and so they've actually yeah. done that for us so this is um yeah so i think this would probably be our parent requirement. uh we'll have yep. i think four different parent requirements right prepare the organization protect software produce well secured software and respond to vulnerabilities those will probably end up being our parent requirements and then we'll have a bunch of children requirements underneath there more than likely so are you saying we'd have a requirement for PO and then a PO.1 and then a PO.1.1? Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's More exactly clear. how it would be. So let's see. Um, if I copy and paste this text, for example, and uh, I'm going to put my screen back over to my IntelliJ now. I've got way too big of a desktop, so I'm not going to share that because the YouTube video would be horrible. But uh, let's see, I'll come back to the standards in just a minute. Um, but the text is basically this. Um, place is paying to, wait, I just said I didn't want to do that. Okay, I'll have to take out all those slash ends and stuff, but this is uh, PO.1. So that would be the identifier, right? Yep. PO.1. And then we can name this um, SSDF um, 1.1 slash PO.1. PO okay. What? Are, are we going to create a, a PO? level uh um well i think this is the po level isn't it or po1 yeah, i don't know P po no one not P yeah there's, there's po1 po2 po3 po4 but you could create a, a requirement we could. at po and just right. say you you must it, the requirement is you must prepare the organization to build secure code, right? Right. You're right. You're absolutely right. So we'd actually have three different levels, right? PO, PO1, PO1.1. So we'd actually exactly. have three different levels in this particular one. Okay. Yeah, we could do that. So let's see. This would be basically um, PO. Yep. And then what is just prepare the organization? Yeah, if you go to the previous page uh, in the requirements, there's prepare the organization description text there. Oh, is there? Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Page four. Perfect. Yep. Got it. Okay. The open CRE, I was just searching to try and find this and I couldn't. So hmm. yeah, I don't think they've uh they I don't think they've released their two uh, two dot oh yet. I think their website yeah. is just really behind at the moment. So I'll reach out and, and see where we're at with that. Um so then this would be, let's see, this would be um in this particular case, then uh PO dot one, its parents would be that would be PO, right? Um, right? We don't have an open CRE right now. Um, 
the fact I'm just well, I'll put it in later once once we know what it is. Um, and then um, if we want to go down, uh, let's see, PO one dot one. Let's see one dot one. Its parent is dot one, and its text is going to be this. Okay, so we've uh, you gotta established do the line forty-eight. What's that? One dot one. Line forty-eight. The identifier needs to be updated as well. Oh yeah, one dot one. You're absolutely right. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is correct. So we've got PO, PO1, PO1.1. Uh, that's this one, and that one is this one. Yes. Okay. All right. So we've established so the hierarchy. Through, yep. And after going through these, I noticed that um, the external references. Do we have something at the standard level for an external reference? Like in this instance, where it's just a PDF and we can't link to specific sections or anything like that. Do we have something at the higher level where we can just put in the external reference once? Um, we can, that's a great question actually. Um, at the standard level, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so if you look at the, the standards there, right, that object, we've got comment, bomb ref, name. I, I think maybe we should have a, a URL we or do. something there. We do. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so that's where I would put the link to the PDF then. Exactly. So let me. Okay, uh, cool. I, I can never. Check. Yeah, I can never remember how the external references actually work in Cyclone. Uh, you would think I would know this stuff, but <laughs> I actually don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Let's fun. see. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, my, my brain is... The attestation a... group stays in the attestation group. <laughs> right on. And YouTube. And YouTube. And YouTube. Oh, that's right. YouTube. Forgot about that. Uh, so let's see. This is how it actually is done. So that means that we can have an external reference like that. And it would point to uh, this particular PDF. Um, and NIST... SP 800 uh, 218, right? Yeah, okay. I think for any of the standards that are in CRE, we ought to be able to just extract them and generate one of these things. Yeah, 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 we should. Well, or, maybe, or, maybe, or maybe in that's the near a feature, future. We can just integrate with them and say, hey, would you add this? Uh, capability and it'll be good for them and good for us yeah i mean they are an os project so um i think right yeah so um yeah and there's a good need for this type of a representation of those standards anyway right. not just for this project that would be very useful in general right okay so we've got um we've got three levels of hierarchy uh the owner now, is NIST, right? Not OMB. Yeah, it, it isn't a NIST document. So let's uh National Institute of Standards and Technology. Yep. So let's uh let's actually change the name. Um and we will give it uh let's see. Uh, okay. Okay, so we've got the standard. We've got three levels of hierarchy within the standard. Uh, levels is not something that we do in in this. 
because uh, there's no level of di difficulty in an SSDF uh, or level of maturity in SSDF. Yeah. So that concept doesn't exist in this. So I'm going to take that out. Uh, we've got the external reference to the standard itself. Okay. Um, all right. Um, to avoid uh, an exercise in um, in copy and paste, I mean, uh, should we continue on with um, with these three things in mind and see if we can actually create an attestation for these three? Yep. Okay. Let's see, that's the first one is 1.1, which is, um, it says, identify and document all security requirements for the organization's software development infrastructure and processes and maintain the requirements over time. Okay. So if I'm an assessor, who, what, what, what kind of role do I want to play? Do I want to be an internal, you know, I think SSDF is primarily um, a, a self-attestation thing, right? So organization is attested yep. themselves and the CEO signs is kind of how it goes, right? Right. So in this particular case, it would be a self-assessment. Okay. I am Acme Inc. Right. <laughs> right. That's who I am. And um, so now we need to choose a target for this attestation. Like maybe it's the the some product. Yeah, one one. Acme Acme Slingshot. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so my application that I'm selling to the feds, right? E slingshot. Um, what's that? Acme slingshot? <laughs> it's an e slingshot because it's like software. <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah. So uh bomb ref uh uh and then uh Okay, um, so let's see. Yeah. Uh, we can have the vendor, obviously, and everything else in there, but um, for the sake of expedience, um, this would go under, well, first of all, we have to do the claims, right? Well, first well, this, you can put it in the target. Yeah, in this particular case, though, Identify and document all security requirements for the organization's software. So, I mean, while I'm selling something to the feds, and that's Acme Slingshot, this is really a requirement for the organization. Hmm. So hmm. let's let's go down to organization, and um, um, Who's this NASA. <laughs> NASA. <laughs> sure. <need> a slingshot. <laughs> Sure, right, right, sure. Uh, <laughs> why not? I how does how does this even work in cycle? I can never remember. Um, aren't I horrible? That's why uh, we write it down. Yes, so I don't have to remember all the time. Yeah, it has a name, URL, and contact, right? Um, Okay, so I'm NASA. Yep. And uh, <laughs> let's see. So this requirement is going to be part of the claim, right? So the target is going to be the company or the organization. Um, uh, 
uh, isn't this requirement on the on the Acme? Um, Acme is building this software, right? I mean, this is yeah, a oh, okay, yeah, question, yeah. like, uh, but it, and then we'll have maybe an yeah, okay, that that's that that'll be good, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, right, so the target is going to be Acme Inc. because that's who is doing the uh, at the stations, and. Um, Acme, um, Acme has, I don't know, I don't know. I'll just basically copy this. Yeah. Documents all security requirements for the organization, software development infrastructures and processes and right. maintain them over time. It maintains the requirements over time. Yeah. Okay. Um, no mitigation strategy. Um, why does this evidence meet the claim? Well, this is. Well, let's evidence. talk about the evidence that you might have well. first, right? Like, you right. might show the requirements document like that would be, <laughs> would be pretty obvious sure. and then you might show the change log All right okay so i could uh okay so if i have for example um identify and document all security requirements how can i show evidence of something without disclosing um intellectual property I mean, I can point them to Jira. I can point them or have a screenshot of maybe my internal, um, you know, portal that has all the policies and stuff like that on it. Um, you told me you had 120 requirements that covered the categories of access control, authentication, validation, logging, encryption, uh, backend connections, and a few other things. Uh, I might be inclined to say like you've met that requirement. Yeah, and that's why I might say that these are like this claim might be too general. Uh, we might want the claims to be more granular, right? And the original thing that was in here might actually have been appropriate. Um, so this is saying, hey, that we, we the requirement is asking you know that the the organization has the policies and procedures in place um, to be able to have a secure software development life cycle, basically, right? Isn't that what the goal of 1.1 is basically? So wouldn't you want to document each of those things as a claim? So yes, we have uh, secure development training. Yes, we have, um, you know, a, a board review of our security posture. Yes, you know, those, each one of those, I would think would be a claim of some kind. Um, and I think that this one would be very general as it is right now. So I'm not sure though, um, if we would want to get that granular or not, but I think that was the original intent with the claims was be able to break it out a little bit as needed. Right. Well, the fact is the, this, the SSDF doesn't say you have to have good requirements. It just says you have to document the. <laughs> True. True. It's that's, that's, completely true. Uh, no, I mean, look, in terms of attestation, we can't go beyond the four corners of this document. Like that's what it requires is a document. And it does not require evidence. It doesn't, but attestation might. Right. Yeah, so I guess then, you know, just looking at the examples that are in there to find policies for securing software development, uh, infrastructures and their components. I mean, that literally could be it. There, there is a SDLC. That could be the claim. It is documented and updated. Here is the JIRA link or here is the Confluence link. Right. And you could 
you can basically and you can basically reiterate the sentence, which is kind of what we did here, um, and then you could supply multiple pieces of evidence for that single claim. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you said, "Hey, there is a document. It's at this link. Uh, here's evidence that we've uh, we've trained them." Uh, and here's evidence that we review it and update it at least annually or whatever. Uh -huh. you know, I don't think it takes a ton of evidence to prove that you got this. No. Um. Counter evidence, we wouldn't have any in this particular case. Well, you could. I mean, if maybe you don't have a change log or something. Oh, for the overtime part? Or, or something. Or you know, maybe you could say, like, uh, this is supposed to be for the whole organization. So you might provide some. I, I discovered in my review that only 12 of the 15 software projects know anything about this standard. Okay, let's let's go down that road. Um, let's um, uh, let's see. So with that, then we'd have two pieces of evidence. One is the the evidence of the software that has gone down the bright path, and then we'd have the couple that aren't, and we'd have the evidence for that. Right. So we'd have. I actually think one we'll find that evidence. pretty frequently. Yep. Like for this one in particular, I think you'd, you'd probably find a bunch of projects that there is a global process, but then there's projects that don't follow it. Exactly. Okay. Um, all right. So let's, let's say that uh, uh, that would be on the counter evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Steve, you know, uh, it occurs even... to me that um, we could give people a real helping hand here by giving them examples of expected evidence in the standard itself. Because right now we're just making it up. Right. Like the people who wrote the requirements ought to really be doing this and detailing out what they would expect the evidence to look like. Not that that necessarily is the only evidence that would work, but you know, like both positive and negative evidence would be great for the standard person to to define. Yeah, and unfortunately SSDF doesn't require any evidence, only a signature. So uh, well, but, that's but attestation, kind of I mean we we can make it part of the standard. Yes, yes, we can. And and you know that's that guidance is probably going to be well received if we do. Um, okay, so what do we want to do here for evidence and counter evidence? So say this requirement, we've got a happy path and a not so happy path, right? Well, let's, uh, let's list the, the requirement document itself as evidence supporting this claim. And you, you, it might be called the secure coding guideline or something, right? It's like, it's, oh, it's, yeah, some, some piece of evidence. Okay. Oh, maybe it's just... What do people call that? Yeah, and maybe um, taking a SDL? cue off of what taking a cue off of what Jeff was saying earlier, it might be good to namespace these a little bit. So, if the evidence is coming from our Acme Inc., it might be nice to just start with Acme dash evidence. Yeah, like yeah. Acme or something SDL like that. one or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to supply evidence of the SSDL. Um, and then, so this evidence would be, um, document. Yeah. It would be a document, right? Yeah. Um, you should probably have that in the list. <laughs> you probably should. Okay. So that would be a document. Um,
Okay. Um, so that's piece of evidence one. And then um, if we have counter evidence, because we don't completely um, adhere to the SSDL, is that the path we want to go down? Yep. Yep. Okay. So why don't we say uh, there, like, we can point to an, an audit that was done. And they, they found that uh, only 50% of projects follow the ACME SSDL. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so we've got positive and negative evidence. And then uh, where was the mitigation thing in here? It was um, in the claim. Mitigation strategy in the claim. Oh yeah, right here. So um, this was an array of text. Oh, no, that was that was evidence of mitigations, right? Okay, so that's just another mitigation thing. Okay, so this would be okay. Yeah. So this would be yet another piece of evidence, and this would be evidence of mitigations. Um. Where did it go? Evidence, evidence of mitigations. And then this could be like a, um, um, I cannot spell today. Okay. So hang on a second. Um, in the standard that we were talking about, wasn't one of the types mitigation? So if you go back to the other tab for a second, uh, observation test results sampling mitigation. So. I think we're going to run into a problem here where everything's going to end up being a document, right? Uh, because it is technically a document of the mitigation plan, but this particular piece of evidence is a type mm -hmm. of thing, right? Um, and I thought, and this is going back a little bit, but I thought that the point of having data in there was so that data could then describe what it was and a link to it. And that that was part of the way of not leaking certain things out was because we could say, hey, the SSDL is documented here. Here's the URL for it, but not actually put it in this, right? We link out to it. But if we wanted to put it in here, we could actually just create a data object with that in there as well. This is going back at least four weeks at this point, though, so I could be completely off base. <laughs> Yeah, I so think the remember data that. could actually be the the results, like. Yeah, and I I don't know the data type um, for Cyclone DX, so I don't know if this is something that can be an external URL or not. But I thought that when we put this in, the reason we put it in was that it could be a URL or it could actually be you know base sixty four encoded data in here of the actual mm -hmm. thing itself. Well, we've got a was data the case? thing here, so. Um, right. But, what's that data form is that only like the raw data or can that also be a url it can be a url it can be base 64 encoded if you want to do it inline okay so um, i might even suggest then that um like for that mitigation one it's it's you know type mitigation and the data would be the url of where the the remediation plan is for example okay and then for documents maybe in this instance, right, one of those is detailed the process used at Acme Inc. Is document the right term for that here? Base 64 
based on what we were talking about types, because I'm worried that document is a bit of a catch-all and we're losing the intent, which was what is the type of this evidence? Right. So on the one above, you could say instead of document, you could say uh, audit or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm not sure what they were there, but yeah, so observation, test results, like that's where this type thing could get very complicated or very simple. And that's, I think, the reason why really early on in the process, we said like that that should be an extendable field. That should be an extendable thing, kind of like um like salsa uh, not salsa like in toto was doing with their their predicates where that could mm, be extendable right. and things could be added to it over time um that's kind of where that suggestion came from because there's going to be a lot of different kind of sub schemas or sub things in here theoretically over time um, and maybe we start simple right and we we keep it as an enum or something for the time being but i do think that this could grow quite a bit because then what's an audit you know, how do we extend that? How do we make it? Um, how do we enable it to be called to call into specific pieces of the audit? Right. So go we're not just saying right, the entire go, audit. Go right for URN. Go for our URN. Completely extensible URNs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we we're going to have to flush out the type a little bit. Yeah, we don't have to solve okay. it right now, but just that that's, I think, a call out is that, that we're, we're, we're defaulting to document everywhere, and I don't think that's the intent. Right, I agree. I think that, like you say, you, you create a, a base schema, CDX, colon, you define all the types you would enumerate it with the URN as the first path and let people add a colon, their own path effort if they want to distinguish, you know, a subtype of some type of higher order document classification name we gave it. Yeah, I mean, you could do something like um, um, and then people could people can add an infinite number of paths to make them happy. As long as it starts with the base path, we can parse the base off. We are all speaking a common dialect. I mean, we know yeah, you could do something like that. We know, we know it's a car. We don't know. We don't not know what Toyota Camry is, but we know it's a car. So. Right. And why don't we put some question marks on that one too? We can we can always come back to this. I do think this is a great exercise though, because we're gonna find things like this. Yeah. And this we could, I mean, we already have Cyclone DX properties. This could be just a registered uh evidence type, could be like one registered property, and then this would be a single field to hold that property. Um, I mean, this is how this is what URNs are used for, like to describe an entire cloud infrastructure. Is what I used for my audit standard right. years ago. Yeah, and uh, we already have a repository with where, where all the registered uh, values are, and that can just you know um, extend over time. It can you know change over time uh, without actually uh, having to rev this back, which is nice. Um, Okay. Um, okay. So we got question mark, question mark on the document. We got question marks on how we might want to do this. That's fine. Um, but we do have, um, in general, though, we've got the claim. We got evidence supporting the claim we've got um i'm sorry evidence supporting the claim we've got the evidence that we were not 100 percent doing what we thought we were doing and then we've got the mitigation evidence so we've got all three of those things all mapped to that one claim which then maps to um to the organization it's a claim for the organization Um, yep. now, now we got to go up one 
and go to the actual attestation, right? <laughs> um, so this was the claim. Let's call this um, um, so this is a claim for for PO one dot one, right? Um, and then uh, this is the actual attestation. So the attestation will be the target would be. That's for ACME, right? Yeah. Or would it be for the particular product offering or both? Probably both. For I this think. one, it's the whole software development organization. Right. Um, and then the requirement or the claims. So that claim is going to go there. The requirement, this is PO 1.1. 1 .1, so um, um, requirement goes here. Uh, counterclaims. There are no counterclaims here at this point. Right. Because the original submitter, the person making the claim, was aware of the... Or, Actually, that's an interesting point. So if an audit was the source of the information that, that we're not actually meeting that standard, I would suggest maybe that is a counterclaim instead of a, you know, part of the claim of the initial claim itself. So the idea we had talked about when we were going through this was that um, if I was making the claim that, yes, we follow our software uh, development lifecycle for everything, I may know that we don't follow it for these two things, for example. And I would put that in in my claim because I know while I'm building it, I'm being honest, this is the case, right? Versus the case where after we've made that claim, an auditor comes in and um, they find that the mm. claim was not accurate and then there would be a counterclaim as a result. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I claim 60% conformance. But the auditor comes in and says, oh, hell no, you don't meet this claim at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, trying to, that's interesting. I think that was actually why we, we had yeah. the idea of the counterclaim, because there's different roles involved, different personas taking these actions at different times. So in this one, maybe we go down um, to where we had that count, uh, where we had the evidence for a second. So if we want to try to illustrate both of these paths, I would scroll down to where we where we said the audit, right? But instead of calling this an audit, I might call this just um, you know uh, the the type again is just that we know this, so the type would just be more documents. Like this might just be another document, whatever that document type is saying that, that we know that 10% of projects are not in the SSDL, right? Gap yeah, analysis, it perfect, be, like that's an in. It, it might be in our dashboard where we're tracking yep. this stuff. Yeah, exactly. So we know this internally. Then I might take uh, copy this, paste it down below as another chunk of evidence from an actual audit, right? And then say that, well, no, it's not actually 50%. It's it's 20% of your projects follow it based on the actual audit. Mm, okay. All right. Right. And then we'll, we'll actually do a counterclaim for that thing. We could try to be a little nicer in this example, you know, make the first one 80% and the second one 50%, <laughs> but. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, this is probably very realistic too, so. Yeah. And uh, don't forget to change the bomb ref. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. 130, 131. Should, okay. those, should, those really, should those really be descriptions? Shouldn't they be more like annotations? If this is somebody's like making a notation, you shouldn't that isn't that the more proper structure than just the flat out description? The annotation? Yeah. What do you mean? Because you can have multiple annotations that you know speak to a, a claim or evidence or whatever, and annotations can be added to by one or more people at yeah. different points of time. Yeah. I think you've got a description of the overall thing that we're talking about here, like the gap analysis, and then there may be additional annotations on top of that. I think maybe we're using description for two things, but I do think that description 
is valuable to provide a general description of what this thing is Agreed. that we're talking about. Agreed. Agreed. General description is like a summary title abstract, but if you want the full annotation, give it a full annotation. Yeah. Go along right. with it. Exactly. Maybe we yeah, put, maybe it. we put that down underneath evidence, like in in the evidence object, we put annotations as an optional. So, so I, I want the example to say, yes, I did, and said, no, you didn't. <laughs> as the kind of as long as the description should say, then the actual annotations should give you the details, right? So in this particular case, though, uh, let's see the uh, my claim would be supporting um, um, right. That's our internal gap analysis. We know that we don't need it. Then there would be another claim. Right. I think that's where Matt, you were coming in and saying, well, maybe instead of doing claims, we do annotations on the, the piece of evidence or annotations on the claim. Well, yeah, I mean, if you introduce annotations, then it, it might cause some co collapsing of, of things, right? So. Yeah, annotations are new as of one five. I think they're brilliant because <laughs> that's exactly what we're doing is for is for human notes. It's for, you know, it's perfect. It is for human notes. I'm not sure if it's good from an evidence relations perspective, though. So I guess how would you Im implement annotations here? Would it be on a piece of evidence? You or can would annotate be... anything that has a bomb ref. So the things that can make the annotations are organizations, people, or tools. If you're one of those three things, then you can make comments on any on any object in the bomb that has a bomb ref. So I don't think we could use annotations for hard decision points or things like that then because the the annotation itself doesn't have an implication of whether it's good bad or indifferent so i guess what i'm trying to understand is if we were trying to annotate this this piece of evidence right um we could argue back and forth in annotations which would be useful so i do i'm not saying we don't use it i'm trying to make sure that we're still um using the the referential integrity here yeah, yeah. to, I think to you, make I think the you, assertions we're trying to assert yeah i i think you keep the context and the, if the okay. with the context then in, yeah claim okay, claim, okay. Yeah, exactly so in this case you know i'm claiming that i do this but i have my internal gap analysis that says oh, i'm only doing 80 percent, but you know close enough and then the attestation comes in and says, oh, no, 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 no. Um, you are not. You're only doing 50%. Right. Um, and then that's where we'd have a counterclaim in there. Right. So we would have another claim with that counterclaim ID. Um, well, wouldn't it it'd be the same claim? I mean, because the attestation is one claim. In this case, it's one claim. And um, then I've got my counterclaim that has, oh, wait, this is not a counterclaim. Right. That's evidence. Right. But the, the counterclaim was just another claim object. There wasn't a separate array that we had for counterclaims. Right. 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 right? So that's so, what I was saying. We just put in another claim here and then it's it is a counter claim so right the, you know claim acme pa one one dash audit or dash counter or something like that acme only does the ssdl for 50 percent of their projects and then uh ssdl um Audit one is my evidence of that. Right. Um, oh, wait, no, that's that's mitigation strategy. Sorry. Um, my evidence of that goes here. Um, there is no counter evidence that doesn't exist because this is a counter claim, essentially. Um, 
Okay, so um, then my counterclaim for this is that um, now and here's an performance would be fifty point five. Right. Exactly, fifty percent. Okay, that uh, simple use case um, turned out to be kind of complex, didn't it? It's good though, because now we can really give a good solid example of all of it, right? And now because we've also done an audit and everything else, our confidence would be a one at this point, right? Because exactly. we know what we were claiming, we know what the audit found, we know reality yep. right now as, as it stands. Yes, yep. Okay, um, mitigation strategy. Now, this is interesting placement because, um, hmm. Can you scroll down? Because I think we might be reusing that. Um, so in the claim, in claim one, I thought we had a evidence down there, didn't we? Claim. Sorry, claim one, mitigation strategy, right? There's the mitigation. So let's scroll up. Where? Scroll up, uh, hold it right here. Line one, 99, mitigation strategy in the claim. Right, so that is uh, our, um, that was basically that we have something in place to address the the things that we know we are not um, doing right now, right? So like this was the 50% one, or no, this was the 80% one, yep. right? So this now here is us saying, right, we know that we're only at 80%. Here's the, the mitigation strategy for getting us to 100%, right? Now, we may want to use that same mitigation strategy for the 50%. Um, right, that was found later. So we might want to use that up in the actual attestation section. So I do think it would be valid in the attestation section, but we may have a completely separate mitigation strategy now because of the audit. No, I mean, right. Uh, right. So it could be either of them. Um, but I do think that it's it would be valid to use the same mitigation strategy if it's like, well, Okay, now we need to, you know, update the list of projects that need to follow this process and reach out to them and get them to follow the process. Right. right? If that's the mitigation strategy, yeah, it still applies. But I think that was the idea with being able to have the mitigation strategy in both locations. Now, here's a question for you. If I have an external uh, assessor actually do this, um, They are now. We we are expecting that at the stations will be signed, right? I thought that was an optional. It should right. be optional because that, an that, internal optional. assessment might not require all that. Right, but let let's say that this was independently verified. That independent third party may not know what the mitigation strategy is going to be, right? Because their job is done. They did an audit, mm -hmm. and they said, "No, you're 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 at fifty percent. Here's your here's your signed list of attestations." Yeah, but I thought we started this with saying that this was a self assessment, right? This particular one. So, I'm just throwing out another use case, though. So, if that was the case, though, um, wouldn't they sign their piece of evidence? They would have signed the audit originally. In theory, so, uh, uh, Steve, are you asking like how can we have the mitigation strategy here inside the signed attestation from right. the external assessor, right. and therefore this mitigation strategy should be somewhere else? That yes, okay, right. But the, I, this I agree with one that. was a self-assessment. This this was we were assessing that we are meeting the requirements for the SSTF. We're just letting people know that we had an audit done, which disagreed with that. This isn't an external auditor assessing us. Right. For this particular one, yes, that is correct. Right. No, I think it's a, I think it's a pointer pointer issue. Do mitigations point to you know failures or or do, do we have it as we have here, which makes more sense? What's up? What makes more so? If I were to compose a self attestation, I have a set of entries. 
So I'd rather have people, if somebody comes back after the fact and says, you, you know, you failed, they can, they have their own place to enter their counter stuff. And, and uh, but if there's a mitigation strategy that is developed a, a time three later time period, I don't want to have to go back. I shouldn't, I feel I don't need to, shouldn't go back and change some, some original data, you know, right. the, the mitigation should be separate and point back to what I'm mitigating. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but at the same time, I think that there's uh, a bit of a flaw here um, with the idea of a signature here at all, because all of this is just reps pointing to other things. There's no real integrity to that signature whatsoever. Valid. So like mm -hmm. if somebody, yeah, because like we could just edit the evidence of mitigations anytime we want. It's it's a link outside of where it's actually signed. Yeah, I think so it's not that I'm going to have time to do it, and I actually don't have time now because I got to go to another call. But, but I mean, it goes back to Sig Store. If this is like if we we're creating some attestation for some automated build, and we're posting a Sig Store, what evidence? What do I need to point to to point to the transparency log record of Sig Store? Um, and it, that typically involves that transparency record points to some identity. So the question is, what what's the you know what's the thing that can get gives me everything for Sig Store? Basically, and I think that for a lesser, lesser path, signage usually needs some type of verifier, an external verifier, which is usually a website that posts the posts the thing as well. So anyway, yeah, and I, I'd I'd take a step back though and say that for this type of a document, it might only make sense to have signatures in certain places or in the entire document as a whole, right? So if we're documenting all of the evidence and all of the pieces within this document, it might make sense to sign the entire document, but not individual pieces of it. Yeah, I, I guess. Then, yeah, no, I no, I agree. I think that I know XML can do this. I don't know about <laughs> I don't know about JSON schema, but you know, there's a XML allows you to do resignings. You can sign. You can continually sign the outer envelope of the document. I don't know if Jason has that concept or not. Do you, Steve? Because I, 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 we want to keep all the people signed it historically over time. Because so people are, it goes back. I was always worried about this. People editing S bombs. And they, the rule is, oh, produce a new one with a new ID and just have a single signature. But really, the, the way the XML and the way the world works, you have a single document and you basically add another signature to it. You re-sign the whole document with the signature that signatures that went before you. Yeah, I think you can do that with JSF, JSON signature uh, format. Um, yeah, I don't know if I like that approach, though, to be honest. Like, the, the, these do change over time. And you do want to know the snapshots of the point in time when they occurred. Right. So why why would you want to keep a rolling set of edits over time versus this was the point in time snapshot for this entire thing? Because hey, I've got to jump, but it, it seems pretty clear like we're gonna need to implement this in blockchain. So, <laughs> well, 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 I mean, that's, that's how, that's how you can the just, you can I just was, write I'm, that down saying, and uh, we can take not, it up on the next saying, call. You might not like Thanks, it, Jeff. But, 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 but that's, I mean, that's the way that the financial world works. You don't create a new and you don't delete. I really do have to go. See you guys. As, right. as you trans, use a transit record across a system, everyone that touches it, you don't create a new entry. You don't dispose of one at every proxy point, every point it gets proxied. You pass the original data across and you, if you have to change it, you resign it basically. You add to it and resign it. Right. Yeah. That's not the way that S bombs work right now, though, right? Because like, when you're actually implementing. They, that's the way they should work, in my opinion. And they should, or at least, should be enabled. You shouldn't. Your your only option should not be to dis, to destroy it and create a whole new signature. So you've lost data. You've lost data. You lost that history. And you're not destroying what? anything. You're keeping the old one because it's for an older version of the software or an older release or an no, older no, no, version of the company. No, if if I build if I build some software and I create an S bomb in my CI process and I sign it and then somebody in my in my CISO org goes and says oh the scanner missed some data i'm going to add or tweak some data here they're 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 basically throwing it over they're tampering with the data but the, if you if they resign if they resave it out and resign it with resign it separately you've lost that original signed document you, re, you lose that in diff you lose that delta you, you use the commit history of a if you're a developer you need the history file you need the blame file you need the commit history basically that, and the documents so that's why XSD was designed that way to keep resigning so you don't so you keep the commit history basically that's why we that's exactly why we used uh it for the e pedigree standard because yeah. that's exactly what happens in real supply chains exactly and, that's, and, I, and I worked on the gold standard which is the banking 
API that works on mainframes back in the 90s. Mm. That's how we signed financial transactions when they sent, they're sent in XML and they get transmitted and re-signed when they transmit institution to institution. Yeah. Well, we are definitely at time. Uh, I do need to drop for another call, but I'm going to go ahead and check in these changes. Um, I thought this was a good exercise. Let's pick it up uh, next week um, and try to flush out some of the, the points that we're discussing now, flush out the document and audit and uh, gap analysis thing that we were talking about, the, the type of evidence, and uh, a few other things next week as well. Sounds good. All right. Cheers. Have a great rest of your day. See you all. All right.